You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. SMS was never really designed to be a secure protocol that everything would hinge upon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some interesting stories to share this week, and later in the show, we're joined by a gentleman who goes by the name Ray redacted online. He's a well-known and respected cybersecurity researcher and consultant, and he's going to bring us up to date on SIM hijacking Mm. and everything you need to know to protect yourself from that. And we are back. Joe, I'm going to kick things off for us this week. This is a story from the folks over at Sophos, their Naked Security blog. This is written by John E. Dunn. And the title of the article is Scammers Use Bogus Search Results to Fool Voice Assistance. Hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. So let's say you need to get in touch with uh, the gas and electric company. Okay. And you need to find their phone number. Yes. How would you go about doing that? I would Google BG&E's phone number, customer That's service number. Baltimore Gas and Electric. That's correct. Right. So you would Google them, and then what? Because I've been through this ringer before, <laughs> <laughs> I make sure that the first link isn't an ad, and uh, I click on the phone number that it calls. So this is a, an interesting twist on that scam. So let okay. me back up a little bit and explain what that scam is. What will happen is, quite often, scammers will buy an ad on a search engine for a commonly used organization that you might call for customer service. Right. For example, your gas and electric company, right. your internet provider, your phone company, all those sorts of things. Yep. So when you do what you just described, which is do a search for customer service, mm-hmm. the first thing that'll pop up is an ad. Is an ad that somebody paid for that pretends to be that company. Correct. And has a phone number that takes you to the scammers. Yes. And the scammers will then lead you down the path of fooling you into believing that they are whoever you're calling, in this Mm -hmm. case, the gas and electric company. But when it comes time to take care of any sort of payment, you're going to be handing over your payment information to them. So this article over on Sophos is an interesting twist on that. It turns out that a lot of people are using their smart voice assistants, your Apple Siri, your Amazon Alexa, Microsoft Cortana, and they will use that assistant and they'll say, please call customer service for the gas and electric company. And that assistant will go to the first result that comes up, right? Precisely. Mm -hmm. And the assistant doesn't have the ability to analyze and discern that there might be something funny about the link or something about the phone number. It just calls the first number that pops up via the search. Huh. And in some cases, that directly connects you to... A scammer. The scammers. So what uh, the folks over at Sophos are saying is don't use your voice assistance <laughs> when it comes time to call these fake accounts. Right. I think that these companies have some guilt to bear here. OK. Because have you ever tried to find like a customer service number for Verizon on their Web page or Comcast on their Web page or Amazon? You ever tried to find a customer service number for yeah. Amazon? Amazon's the, the, the granddaddy of them all yeah. when it comes to. It's impossible to yeah. find their customer service number. Yeah. And I think that alone is a large contributing factor to this problem. I agree. And I find it interesting. I actually was actually thinking about this in the last week, that I think it's a bad thing that as consumers, we've allowed it to get to this point, that these companies make it hard or sometimes impossible to get a real human on the phone. Yes. And we've just accepted that in the modern world of online electronic purchasing and so on and so forth, that we're okay with that. An automated system would be fine. Right. For some things. Sure. But for other things, if you really have a problem, it's nice to talk to a real human. Yeah. When, I, when I'm calling these customer service organizations, I have a question that I haven't been able to find the answer to on the Internet. Mm, so mm-hmm. I need a human who knows it's, the answer. It's your last resort. It's my last resort. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't like dealing with people. I really don't like talking on the phone. Combine those two things together. And you already have me in a situation where I need to get a hold of somebody. Right. And now you're going to prevent that from happening. You're already irritated I by am. having to do that. <laughs> at all. In this article, they talk about how 
obviously the search engines are doing their best to try to prevent these scam phone numbers from bubbling to the top. Right. But like all these sorts of things, it's basically it, a whack-a-mole game. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, You'll kick one out of the results, another one will pop up. Mm-hmm. So the advice here is to always manually check these on the web. Yep. Don't rely on your voice assistant. I would also say don't rely on the search engine. In other words, if I wanted the uh, phone number for my gas and electric company, mm -hmm. I think the safest thing to do would be to go to their website. Right. Actually, the safest thing to do would be to pull out your bill that they mailed you. <laughs> right. But, but the, the next safest thing would be to go to their actual website, find the number on their website and call that number rather than relying on the number that the search engine gives you. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'm probably not going to do that. I'm probably going to Google the number and then scroll down until I can find it, knowing that the first couple of numbers are, are ads or scams or something. Yeah. It's an unfortunate state that we live in, Dave. <laughs> it's just good as well. <laughs> it gives us the opportunity to have this show, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> so right, we'd go. be out of jobs if, yeah, that's right, exactly. if this wasn't the case. <laughs> right. All right. Well, uh, we'll have a link uh, in the show notes to this story. Again, it's uh, the Naked Security blog over from the good folks at Sophos. So uh, do check that out. That is my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Do you like video games, Dave? I do like video games. I, I can't say I have as much time to play them as I used to, but I do enjoy video games. Yes. Do you know what Steam is? Are you familiar with Steam? Mm -hmm. Yep. So Steam is a company, or actually a product, rather, a storefront from a company called Valve. And Valve is the game company that came up with the fantastic game Half-Life. Okay. And a couple of years ago, many years ago, they said, we're going to have a Steam game client where you can go out into our store and you can buy the games. This is how Valve decided they were going to reduce piracy of their games is that now in order to play the game, you'd have to have a Steam account and that would validate your copy of the game. But the flip side for the customer is it's really, really convenient. Mm -hmm. So every time I rebuild a, my computer, which has happened a number of times since I've been a Steam customer, all I have to do is install the Steam client, log in, and there are all my games. They're so right it's, there. it's kind of single sign-on for your games. Exactly. Okay. And it's great. Now, I'm not a hardcore gamer. I only have about 40 games that I've, I've purchased over the past seven to 10 years, and uh, I don't play all of them. There are a few that I play more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But Steam has two features that I don't use very much, but a lot of people do use. Okay. And the first feature is they have a social platform feature. And this lets you have friends and send your friends messages. So I can see when my friends are playing, like maybe Counter-Strike or something, and maybe get in and, and play with my friends. It's a great, oh, I see. great mm -hmm. feature. I can also receive messages. We can coordinate times and do that. But then they have this other capability called the Steam Inventory. And I had to look this up because I don't use this feature of Steam. But from the Steam site, without a game server, the game client can communicate directly to the Steam service to retrieve users' inventory contents, consume and exchange items, and receive new items granted as an effect of playtime. Hmm. Here's the key. Users can also purchase items directly from the item store or trade and exchange markets in the Steam community. So users can trade and exchange game items in their Steam inventory. So let's say I'm playing some game where there's a highly coveted gun right. or something like that, yep. and I have acquired that. I could sell that to you? Yep, and I might actually pay you real money for that. Okay. Now, I will never pay you real money for that because I just don't see the value in this. I don't see why you would trade items like this. I, it does not appeal to me as a gamer. It seems kind of like cheating. And I want to play the game and enjoy the experience, right? Yeah. But, but other people will do this, and that's fine. I sure. Don't, I don't have a problem with that. But now that we have the background information, Lawrence Abrams over at Bleeping Computer has the story on this scam. And we'll put a link in the show notes, but here's how it works. It starts with the victim getting a message on that social platform. Right. And it says, there's somebody giving away free games. Here's the link. And the link is steamsafe.fun. Hmm. That's the URL. Right. And that's actually the URL you go to. So if the user clicks on this link, that web page finds a malicious server that's in its network that's up because these malicious servers are constantly getting taken down. But this steamsafe.fun probably doesn't do any malicious activity other than routing the users. Hmm. So it, it's still up. It's still a good domain. But if you click on that, you wind up at a web page that kind of looks like Steam, but says it's like birthday codes or something. But it says in the in the middle of the page, try your luck, spin to see if you win a free game. And then it even says below that you can only spin once a day, right? Mm -hmm. So they create the illusion of scarcity. Mm. If you spin, you win. Right. It picks a game that says here you win and it shows you something like a game unlock key, a code that you have to enter to unlock the game. And it says, hey, you won. 
why don't you go to Steam to collect your winnings? And then it presents you with a login page. Oh. Now, the login page is, of course, fake. But right? it looks just like but Steam. It, it looks exactly like Steam. Mm. Lawrence has these pictures in here, and I've used Steam. You know, of course, I've talked about that. <laughs> but it looks the same. Hmm. Not only that, but if you have two-factor authentication set up on this, it will prompt you for the two-factor code that it either mailed you or that is on your phone. Oh. Right? So it circumvents the two-factor authentication through social engineering. Right. Really good web impersonation. So what happens then? They take all, take all your stuff? Well, what they what they do is they log into your account. They immediately change your password. Mm. They change your email address. They change your phone number. And now you're effectively locked out of your account. Mm -hmm. It's been stolen. Now, if this happens to you, thankfully, you can open what's called an account recovery support ticket with Steam. And you can get your account back with your games and everything. However, if the attackers go into your inventory, then they trade away or give away the stuff that's in your inventory. That stuff is gone and, hmm. and Steam will not replace it. Their policy is we're not going to replace items that have been traded away because we don't really know if these items have been traded away or if you actually gave them away or this is some kind of ruse. Mm -hmm. So we really can't just create new items and give you these items because that actually lowers the value of these items. So... Imagine a, a scenario where you say, here, Joe, take this gun that you were talking about, and I mm -hmm. take the gun, mm -hmm. and then I give it to somebody else who then gives it back to you, right? Mm -hmm. And then I claim, hey, my gun was stolen. Mm -hmm. And then Steam says, well, here's another gun, right? So now you and I both have the gun. Right. Well, Steam doesn't let that happen. Valve, who owns Steam, says, well, that's against our policies. If you lose the gun, the gun is gone. Yeah. Now, these things all Seems have real, reasonable. Yeah, it does seem reasonable. These all have monetary value, and I think that's how these scammers are monetizing this scam. But they're targeting gamers, of which I am one. So I take it personally, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Joe, our catch of the day this week comes from a listener named Melum. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize in advance if I have not. Melum writes, Hello, I'm a fan of your podcast, The Cyberwire and Hacking Humans. Attached is a phishing email I received recently. Two things I noticed. It's written in good English, and the Google filters are so smart to flag it as a spam, although it contains no links, hmm. which is... Kind of interesting. It is. The top of the message here that uh, Melum sent along, it says, this message seems dangerous. So it's a standard Google warning that you get in Gmail saying, beware, right. we, we, we're flagging this, that it's probably up to no good. Yep. And it is in uh, very good, better than average English from what we get with these. So right. uh, it goes like this. Hello there. I got your contact from an online directory and I have a proposition that may be of interest to you. I have a friend whose father is a former minister in the South African government. During the period when her father was a minister, her dad used his office to amass lots of wealth through kickbacks from oil and aviation contracts. He's currently facing problems with the current administration and all his assets have been seized locally. He has also been restricted from traveling abroad. Fortunately for him, he has a high value asset in Europe that has not been seized yet and he wants this asset moved and secured ASAP. He prefers for it to be invested into projects that can yield high returns. His daughter, who is my friend, has asked me to help her look for a reputable businessman who can accommodate and invest this fund discreetly on behalf of the family. I am contacting you on the basis that you would be willing to help us. Of course, you will also be generously rewarded for your efforts, so it will be definitely worthy of your time. Please let me know if you are interested so that I can give you more details. Regards, Robert Matare. Hmm. Yeah. What do you think the end game is here, Dave? Uh, I think it's the truth called the treasure box scam. Yeah. It's a variation of that. This one pops up a lot. Mm -hmm. Someone has some money they need to move and they need your help moving it. Right. And there is no money, of course. Mm -hmm. You have to pay who knows. I, I think this is the first step of just seeing if we got a live one. Right. Yep. Just reach, you know, if you if they get a response, yeah, then who knows where this will go. Right. Th that is definitely the case, uh, almost certain. First off, there's no links in here for anything else to happen. They're looking for you to reply, and then they're yelling, fish on. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's remarkable to me, several things about this. They say, I got your contact from an online directory. That's mm -hmm. random. Right. So they didn't really reach out to me. Right. I, I mean... They, okay. They spun the wheel and I won. <laughs> I guess. But then also talking about this dad who used his office to amass lots of wealth through kickbacks. Right. 
So, so you want to help a, crook. a crooked government, yeah. <laughs> crooked <laughs> exactly. government official right. hide his money? Again, playing on people's greed. Yes. As we've talked about before, maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's part of the filtering process that right. they're looking for someone who's willing to, who has that moral flexibility to uh, go along with some people who've already announced that they're crooks. Right. They're greedy and uh, they're looking for someone who's greedy and gullible. All right. Well, that is our catch of the day. Coming up next, we are joined by Ray Redacted. That is the name he goes by online. And he's going to tell us all about SIM hijacking and share what he knows about ways to protect yourself from that. And we are back. Uh, Joey recently had the pleasure of speaking once again with Ray Redacted. That's the name he goes by online. It's a very popular Twitter account, which uh, is worth checking out. And he is uh, very well known in the cybersecurity world. He's a researcher, consultant, uh, works with um, many companies around the world. But today we're talking to him about SIM hijacking and getting his take on that. Here's my conversation with Ray Redacted. SIM hijacking, or sometimes called SIM swapping, uh, refers to a type of social engineering attack where an adversary convinces a carrier to port your telephone number to their SIM so that they can then impersonate you for other purposes. In many, many cases, adversaries have figured out that if they can grab control of your cellular communication, specifically your SMS, that short messaging service on your cellular provider, in many cases that's used for password resets on services such as Gmail and Hotmail, uh, in order to pretend like they lost their password and they want that reset. And this is something where uh, I, I can't just go out and uh, copy a SIM on my own like I can copy a, a file on a, an SD card or something like that. They're, they're more sophisticated than that. When people to use the term SIM hacking, when they actually say SIM hacking, sometimes erroneously they use that term to refer to SIM hijacking hmm. because SIM hijacking is not cloning your actual SIM. It's actually convincing your cellular provider to port your phone number to a new or different SIM. Uh. So it's, it is a social engineering based attack. Uh, and it ultimately usually involves someone either going into a store to pretend they're Dave Bittner or perhaps calling into a contact center pretending that they're you and convincing the carrier, I've lost my cell phone, I have a different cell phone or a different SIM now, can you port my number to this new one? They're fairly successful at this. They've, they've come up with ways that, that they can do this reliably. Well, in North America, it's quite rampant. I mean, interestingly enough, we don't see this problem nearly as much in Europe because the process of porting takes several days. But in North America, our cellular porting procedures are relatively efficient. So it becomes an attack surface that's you know relatively common. Now, how did this come to your attention? How did you get involved in, in doing research on this? Well, you know, Dave, I actually kind of come from two different worlds in the cybersecurity realm. My day job basically is helping companies connect and protect their data all over the world, specifically multinational corporations. But I also do a lot of speaking and research in the crypto asset community. That's the, the cryptocurrency world, the Bitcoin world, et cetera. And what's kind of interesting about the overlap of those two is that in the crypto asset world, this is an extremely common spear phishing type of an attack. Meaning if someone knows that someone holds crypto assets, for example, if they're constantly talking about it on Twitter or if they've got a podcast about it, it's very, very common for them to become a target for SIM hijacking because ultimately the goal of the attacker is to get a hold of those Bitcoins or get a hold of those crypto assets. It's a lot harder for the uh, victim to recover financial losses when there's been this type of an attack uh, propagated on them. Can you give us some firsthand examples? First and foremost, you know, I think you've had Rachel Toback on your show quite mm -hmm. often. And one of the big piece of advice that she gives is that if you really want to learn about social engineering, periodically try to social engineer your own accounts, like call your gas company, see how hard it is for them to give you up, you know, the data about yourself, you know, without giving them necessarily a lot of information. And I actually do that myself every year on several different cellular providers. And I'm always hmm. surprised at how easy it is to get a new SIM assigned. The cellular providers in North America have procedures to prevent this. And they have some things that you can do to make it more difficult, but it's typically not very difficult to get somebody else to take sympathy on you, so to speak, and to try to help you out with this. If you, if you think about the normal you know, mechanism that somebody has lost their cell phone, I mean, it is, mm -hmm. a, it is a state of complete panic usually if you've lost your phone before because our lives are so connected to it. 
And so when they're contacting a, a cellular provider and saying, I lost my cell phone, you know, like, I can't get a hold of anybody, I can't do anything, et cetera, that's a moment of desperation. And most people in contact centers are there to try to relieve that desperation. So it is surprisingly easy to get a port done over the phone or especially in person with even the most minimal amount of identification. Now, who's being targeted here? If, if I'm a, you know, just a, a, your average Joe uh, out and about minding my own business and going about my life, am I likely to have someone come after me in this way? Well, there certainly are cases of that. And I know that back in episode 51, you and Joe were talking about this Google report that talked about how SMS, two-factor authentication, you know, thwarted over 90% of the automated attacks on trying mm-hmm. to, you know, grab a hold of accounts. But in my experience and in the real world, if someone knows that you are a Gmail user or a Hotmail user and they have some basic information about you, probably via OSINT or open source intelligence they've gathered on LinkedIn or wherever else, it is very possible that they will attempt an attack like this because they know that there's a good chance that having your SIM ported to them will allow them to do a reset on your master mail account. And for many people, that's where they keep their banking credentials. That's where they keep their, you know, certainly crypto asset credentials and just about everything else is that if I have access to your Gmail, I might have access to password resets for a ton of accounts, some of which you may not even know. And it's actually somewhat worse because a lot of people will use Chrome as their password manager. And Mm. if you have access to someone's master Gmail account or their master Google account, in some cases, you also have access to all of their Chrome passwords as well. So what are your recommendations for protecting yourself against this? Well, so first and foremost, I mean, I know there's been a raging debate in the InfoSec community about is SMS multi-factor authentication better than nothing? And I'll tell you definitively 100 percent. It's absolutely better than nothing. There's there's no reason to abandon any type of multi-factor out there. However, you do want to think about, is there a way to uh, protect myself on my main Gmail account, for example, from somebody that has access to my phone or to my SIM from being able to do resets? And there are several steps that you can take uh, in order to do that. One of the more obscure tricks that a lot of folks should do is they really don't use their primary cell phone number for those resets. You can get a Google Voice uh, number for free. You could get a Text Now account for either free or very minimal and use that only for those SMS resets. But the idea is, is you want to separate it so that there's more steps necessary before somebody gets access to your full account. Okay. Another one is obviously is using a password manager. I know you have recommended that for a very, very long time. Mm. I would go further than that and say, do not use your browser as your password manager, because if your browser is synced to a cloud service, then once they get access to that cloud service, they may have access to all your passwords. Now, is there a way that that I could call up my cellular provider and say, basically, you know, I want to put some sort of two-factor on my SIM itself? Absolutely. So there are different means that every carrier provides. And some of these are a little bit confusing because, for example, you can put a pin on your SIM (laughs) itself, (laughs) uh, which locks that SIM from being accessed by somebody who has physical access to it. But that's not the same as putting a pin on the porting of that SIM. So basically, you're putting a password on the disk itself, but not on the data that you know could be accessed via that disk. Hmm. Uh, but in addition, all four of the major carriers in North America have different procedures for you to provide a secondary layer of porting protection in order to prevent this type of service from happening. The problem with that is, and it sounds perfect, right? I'll put a totally different pin, you know, for porting purposes. The problem is, is that in that state of panic, so many people forget that they even put a pin on their porting, Mm. that in my experience, it may be something that can be overridden with some basic social engineering. So you should absolutely do that because it makes it more difficult for an adversary to actually port you away. Um, You can also add notes to your account that I do not want my SIM ported without showing you my passport or my state driver's license, for example, rather than a water bill or God forbid, a yearbook photo or something like that. (laughs) Um, You can put notes in there too. But at the end of the day, the real answer to preventing this type of an attack is to separate your primary password managers and your email accounts from simple SMS resets. 
Uh, in addition to that, I will tell you that some of the folks out there are still using knowledge-based authentication, which is what was the name of your high school? Mm. What street did you grow up on? And as I know, we've covered many, many times on this podcast, that just simply is not a good layer of security because most of that stuff is readily accessible you know, for someone who knows how to use Google. I guess in addition to making your SIM as secure as possible, you want to make it so that if someone does do a SIM swap on you, it's really not going to have that much effect. Correct. And you would know it relatively quickly because suddenly your phone would start acting weird. You might start getting emails that say password resets have happened. You might even be locked out of your email itself, right? But at the end of the day, if you know for a fact that somebody who does have access to your primary cell phone number hoarding doesn't have access to the vast amounts of data that you don't want them to get to, it's a lot easier to mitigate the damage and to respond. Is there any reason why people shouldn't move away from SMS as a second authenticator? Should we move towards things like Google Authenticator or, or YubiKeys, those sorts of things? Well, certainly, you know, one of the reasons why so many of us no longer refer to it as two-factor authentication is because multi-factor authentication in many cases is a much better descriptor for not just using two factors, but using multi-factors. For example, Mm -hmm. you know, with Gmail, you know, you can set up your Gmail so that it only asks you for that YubiKey if it looks like you're coming from an unknown IP address, right? You can also use uh, OTP-based programs such as Authy or Google Authenticator. And they're certainly better than simply using SMS. SMS was never really designed to be a secure protocol that everything would hinge upon. But again, the point is not to scare people out of using multi-factor at all. Instead, to say there may be more intelligent ways to do it. Joe, what do you think? Lots of good information. Everything Ray was talking about was one of the reasons that we say SMS is the least secure form of two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. But Uh, way better than nothing. Way better than nothing, right? It was never intended to be a secure means of communication. Interesting how, you know, much of it hinges on social engineering, that ability to play on the sympathy of the person at the uh, support center. Correct. To, yeah, it, to switch that over. And that's how this works. You call them up in a panic or you, maybe you play babies crying in the background and you mm-hmm. say, I can't get things to work. People want to help. That's what we've talked about on this show before is that people by their nature are good and they want to help. That, in effect, lets people take advantage of that situation. And you wind up with this social engineering attack that can absolutely destroy your security. I find it interesting that people who have cryptocurrency and talk about it. I mean, first off, if I had cryptocurrency, I wouldn't talk about it online. Yeah, but I guess if you run Joe's cryptocurrency podcast. Right, exactly. Then then, then Joe's going to become a target. for Yeah. Uh, And again, knowledge based authentication is pretty much no good at all, because if you you do enough research, you do a people search on me, you'll find the, the street that I grew up on. Our thanks to uh, Ray Redacted for joining us. Always a pleasure to speak with him. Do check him out online. He's got a uh, very active Twitter account, does a lot of good things for the security community. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Our staff writer is Tim Nodar. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. 